Thank you. That was a 20th century version of The Cowboy's Lament, uh, arranged by Roy Harris. Yes. And um, it's uh, The Streets of Laredo or The Cowboy's Lament. We've heard it many, many times before. It was a favorite on the Old North Trail, the Cowboy Trail, that the Cowboys took from Texas to points north in Montana, Wyoming, and, and other um, cattle markets. Now, may, you may be surprised to know that music was a huge part of the cowboy's life. And um, it wasn't a cowboy sitting on a, on a horse strumming as he went along. There wasn't room because he had to carry his bedroll and everything. But the, the music served the purpose of keeping the cattle calm uh, and keep the, keeping the cattle from stampeding. The music also was a way to keep the cowboys awake at night. When they were on watch, they would exchange verses. One would sing, then the other cowboy would answer back, and they'd go back and forth and back and forth. Um, they'd use the same melody oftentimes and then just add on and add on to it. So that's a, uh, in one chapter of my book, The Cowboys uh, Music. I want to begin, and um, before I forget, I want to thank the Fort Walla Walla Museum for hosting me tonight. This is such a treat to come here. I've been waiting um, to come here through the pandemic and after the book was out and everything. So um, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you, Ella. I want to open with an introduction, the, intro the preface to my book, because it gives you a little insight into my connection to music and to the West and to the healing qualities of music in hard times, which is much what this book is about. On a Sunday, April morning in 1981, my dad drove me from our house down on Airport Road to the Shoto High School parking lot where I would catch the bus for a multi-school concert band festival, which would be held in Conrad, a neighboring community. Both Conrad and Shoto are rural communities located along the eastern side of the uh, Rocky Mountain Front, wide open country where the plains dramatically meet the mountains. Our middle school band had been preparing for months. 
I loved playing my French horn, and I couldn't wait to get to the festival. When my dad pulled into the parking lot, my friends were waiting on the sidewalk alongside a collection of music stands and instruments. Not much has changed for me from then to now. I'm still surrounded by music and instruments. Excited to get on with the day of music, I leaned over, kissed my dad on the cheek, hopped down from the seat of his vintage turquoise Ford pickup, and slammed the door shut, which is the only way to close the door of an old Ford. As my dad slowly pulled away, he casually waved goodbye out of his open window, and that was the last time I saw him. While I was in Conrad playing my French horn, he died in a head-on collision on the Augusta Highway, just a few miles outside of Shoto. A staggering loss. We were down to three. My mom, my eight-year-old brother, and me, just 12 years old. There's nothing to do but go on with the business of life one day at a time. My mother single-handedly raised me and my brother while working full-time. Knowing how important music is to my heart and soul, she provided access to private piano, vocal lessons, music camps, and arranged for us to attend performing arts events that came through town. Music became, became my therapy and my solace in this face of tragedy. I was working on the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata at the time of my dad's accident, and it expressed to me at that time the complex emotions I was feeling, anger, sadness, and grief. Music provided comfort in my time of need, just as many of the immigrants in the 1800s found comfort in music in the throes of their physically and emotionally difficult journeys westward. Many of them suffered the loss of family and friends along the way. My book, The Westward Expansion, offers a view of the Oregon Trail and frontier communities through the lens of music, highlights the power of music in difficult times, and encourages the reader to add enriching, meaningful, and healing musical experiences into their personal lives. Most Americans have heard of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, the Oregon Trail, and the Westward Expansion, but few people are aware that an integral component of this mu movement was music. This music explores a variety of music traditions, of the f of, um, including the Northern Cheyenne courtship flute, fiddle music of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, French tunes, dancing fur trappers, hymn singing missionaries, piano playing nuns, girls with guitars, wagon driving balladeers, cowboy crooners, opulent theaters, music instrument showrooms, Chinese slow-na players, singing farmers, opera enthusiasts, musical miners, and preaching songsters. So that is the music of the Westward Expansion. Tonight I want to offer just little glimpses of some of the stories that are offered in the book and give you a, a taste of the music that is mentioned in the book. I want to kick it off with the Northern Cheyenne Courtship Flute. I'm going to play a little bit. To me, this flute represents the people that were here in the West way before the United States sent the Lewis and Clark expedition and the, before the fur trappers came and before the missionaries came out. When I first started on the project of this book, um, I wanted to include a, a, an indigenous voice um, that was real and somebody that really knew what they were talking about. And so I found that through Jay Oldmouse of the Northern Cheyenne tribe of Southeast Montana. And he didn't have a website. This took some detective work. Um, he, he was the builder and the uh, preserver of the 
Northern Cheyenne tradition for his tribe in Busby, Montana. So I got a hold of him on the phone, and uh, Joe, my husband, and I flew out to Montana, where I grew up, um, and we met, uh, we drove out to Jay Old Mouse's home. And when we got to his home, his wife, Amy, and Jay welcomed us in, and on his kitchen table, he had uh, Northern Cheyenne flutes that dated back to the 1800s. He had them in a, in a trunk um, with different uh, beading decorations, different sizes, um, and he traces his lineage back to uh, a man named Turkey Legs. So it went Turkey Legs, Grover Wolf Voice, Black Bear, and then Jay, who uh, at the time was 53. He's on, he was only two years older than me. And um, so he shared the history of the flute and the purpose of the flute, which is to woo a woman. Um, typically, women love men with, uh, that play an instrument, so it, it worked. Uh, they would go to the flute maker of the tribe, and they would ask the flute maker, maker to build a flute for them. They would trade in goods such as blankets, beads, horses even, to, to have a flute built for them. And then when all was quiet, they would go um, sit on a bank somewhere, and they'd play the music, something from their heart, and hope to woo their sweet, his sweetheart. And if the love was meant to be, the woman would come and meet with the man, and they would talk, and it would grow from there. So it's, a, it's an instrument of love. On the top of it here is an elk, which is the animal of love. And there's beaded work. It's made from cedar. And uh, just also, the flute is very wonderful, but Jay Oldmouse, was, it was such a spectacular day to meet him, to listen to him play his flute. And over the couple years after that, we became good friends. And then during COVID, we did a lot of FaceTiming, and, and I was asking him more about the flute. He was also what's called the town crier, which means he would load up his pickup truck and drive around Busby and give um, announcements to people, like stay home and stay safe from COVID. This was during the pandemic. And unfortunately, he died from COVID. So it, it's a huge loss. 100 of his flutes are out there, and I am just so happy that I can share his story and that I, I had this amazing experience with him. And I don't know, um, they don't know yet what's going, going to happen to the tradition of the flute, but I, I imagine there's something in the works. So that is the story of the flute. So what kicked off the westward expansion for the U.S. was the Lewis and Clark expedition. And of course, the Lewis and Clark expedition had m many, many interactions with native peoples along the way. Um, all in all, they traveled 4,000 miles from uh, uh, St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean and back again. And did you know that they had two fiddle players in the expedition? <laughs> okay. They had uh, a fiddle player named Pierre Crusat, and they had George Gibson. Pierre Crusat was the son of an Omaha uh, Indian mother and a French father. So he was a Mati um, fiddler. And the Mati people are people of European and native descent. And that group of people is still today carries on a tradition of fiddling, um, Métis fiddling, which is a spe specific type of fiddle playing. During the expedition, how do we know about the music from the journals? When I researched about the music during the Lewis and Clark expedition, over 100 journal entries mention um, music. Music played in camp um, by the fiddle players while the men danced and often exchanges between native people and the, the expedition. The most poignant exchange, I think, happened not far from here at uh, Walula at, on the river. And that is when Chief Yellowpit, this was on their return journey in 1806, asked the men to share one of their medicine songs. And then the, the Indians would share one of their medicine songs. Well, 
the, the um, Lewis Clark expedition shared two songs. This is indicated in the journals, and the, the um, Wallulas shared one song. Do you think they could have written down what song they chose at this <laughs> monumental occasion? No, they didn't. In all those 100 journal entries, they didn't mention one piece of repertoire. So we have to just speculate. Perhaps it was a hymn. They probably sang and danced to fiddle tunes in camp, probably French, French songs because of Pierre Crusat. Um, they might have sang popular songs of the day. So I, anyway, I have a um, fiddle tune medley for you in honor of the Lewis and Clark expedition. The first tune in the medley is Whiskey Before Breakfast, which is fitting because right along the two fiddles, they made room for whiskey, which is mentioned way more than 100 times in the journals. So we have Whiskey Before Breakfast, Shandon Bells, The Cook in the Kitchen, and Old Dan Tucker, arranged for piano <laughs> by me. So this gives you the feel. Imagine Pierre Crusat in camp fiddling while the men of the expedition danced, danced around and maybe visiting uh, native people. Okay, on the heels of um, Lewis and Clark came the missionaries. The missionaries were going to Christianize all of the native people in the West. And so two of the people, the most uh, famous people, Narcissa and Marcus Whitman, came out West. And um, Narcissa was known for her beautiful singing voice. And that's one of the tactics that she used to um, work with the, the uh, Nez Perce. She would sing um, to them, and they would love the singing, but nobody converted. 
before she left, um, the night before she left, she was married, and she sang a hymn. And the hymn was, Yes, My Native Land. And the guests of the wedding cried into their handkerchiefs because they knew they would never be seeing her again. She was traveling by boat, wagon, by horseback, riding side saddle, and sometimes by foot all the way west. And, and they were right. They, she did never see her family again. So in honor of the missionary part of the story, I have um, a, a, a collection of three hymns, including Yes, My Native Land. I'll just play and sing the first verse of it so you get an idea of what she sang before she departed. And then I have What Wondrous Love Is This and Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Yes, my native land, I love thee. All thy scenes, I love them well. Friends, connections, happy country, can I bid you? talk a little bit about 19th century music in the East and what people were leaving behind. Um, when they got word from the missionaries that started coming more and more out West, the people in, in the East thought, this sounds great, free land, um, healthy living conditions, freedom, wide open spaces. Uh, the East had become very crowded from all of the immigrants moving in from Europe. Um, there was disease, there was unsanitary um, conditions, it was very overcrowded, um, there was economic downturn. So this, the promised land that the missionaries talked about sounded great, and everybody caught Oregon fever. And that's why 400,000 people in, in the course of the 1800s came out west. What did they leave behind? Uh, these were people that were used to having a rich musical life. If you were a middle class person or upper, upper middle class person, you had a piano in your house. Or if you didn't have a piano, you might have a harpsichord, you might have a harp, um, you might have a guitar, a violin, some kind of music. Because that is how people entertained themselves in the home and then they went out to concerts to listen to live music. The music that they played was um, a mixture of things, much like the melting pot of America. They, took, they pulled from the opera, they pulled from the symphony, 
They pulled from um, folk songs, hymns, and popular music of the day. The very first um, singer-songwriter was Stephen Foster. And he was probably, um, yeah, one of the most popular people that pe people would rush out and go to the general store and buy his sheet music. And so that's one of the artists that, of the time. Um, I want to just play a little bit of Jeannie with the light brown hair, just to, to give you a feel of the music that, was, that resounded with people. It was um, music of love. It was music that talked about home. It was... It was sweet music, the sweet life, which is go it's quite opposite of what these people were about to face on the Oregon Trail. So, as people started pa packing up for the Oregon Trail, they had to leave behind their grand pianos, or their pianos, their smaller pianos, their uh, bigger instruments, their harps, and they took portable instruments on the trail. Um, those included the violin and the guitar. And interesting, it, the guitar was very popular with uh, women. I read a lot of journal accounts of women playing the guitar and the men played the violin. Um, early in the, in the 19th century, women didn't play the violin because they thought it would disfigure their face. They thought the guitar was a more ladylike instrument. Um, and one thing I wanted to say, it was the mark of a, of a, a well-cultured woman, who, if she could play some music. And it was the same for a man. If he could recall a song for, the, for any occasion and sing it, that was a very manly quality. So music was a very important part of the culture. And it was also a, a part of um, men and women getting to know each other. Uh, at the piano, they could play duets together and that was socially acceptable, or a man could lean over and turn page for a, the lady while she's playing the piano. So they could be close together, and that was a, an acceptable way. And so anyway, they had to leave those pianos. And pianos then came out west later um, by wagon. Some salesmen brought one piano at a time, would drop it at a homestead, 
and he'd, he might say, oh, I just need to put this piano here for tonight, and then he, can I bring it into your house? And then the, the wife and the daughters might say, oh, can we keep it? And so then they would buy, end up buying the piano that way. Pretty good sales tactic. In the book, there's a, a picture of a family in Nebraska who brought their organ out into the barnyard. It's very rustic. And they had a picture, their family picture taken around the organ because they wanted people to know that they were civilized. I mean, there are chickens and cows and animals around them, but they have that organ and they're in their best clothes. So it was very important. Um, so uh, I want to read two, two things about the Oregon Trail, just small um, quotes. One, to give you an idea of just how rough it is, how rough it was, and how much these people needed comfort, and they found that comfort in music. Um, okay, so, okay, this is by um, uh, Mrs. J.T. Gowdy in 1852. She wrote, uh, there is so much sickness and so many deaths. The poor cattle, too, died by the hundreds, starved and overworked. The plains were covered with their carcasses and the air was polluted with their sickening odor. I wonder how many of us lived through it all, just thinking of, of lying there with a burning fever in a roughly, rough, jolty wagon on a big feather bed put on top of a pile of things all jumbled up with nothing between you and the burning sun but the wagon cover in that smothering dust with sometimes not a drop of fresh water for two days and hardly ever a bit from one camping place to another. It was often the water a stagnant pool with nothing to eat but fat, salt, bacon, bread, and coffee cooked on a sagebrush or grease wood fire. These were tough times. People watched loved ones drown. There were accidents all the time, the accidental discharge of firearms. People got run over by the wagon. Children got left behind because they ran off and they couldn't be found. Um, People would drink tainted water and die. It was tough. And here's an example of um, some people in making music to lighten their, to bring some light to their day. A few evenings ago, we were gratified by hearing the most artistically executed music we have listened to for many a day. Four newly arrived pilgrims sat upon a log by the wayside and sang Faded Flowers and Maggie by my side for their own gratification. The time, tune, and pathos of the music arranged as quartets were really beautiful. The poor fellows had solaced themselves many a time and oft with the sweet harmony and sentiment of the songs after a weary day's march over the plains and before parting. They united their voices once more in the songs that reminded them of the loved ones in the old house at home. That was written in the Montana Post in 1865. So many of the journal entries about music on the Oregon Trail mention specific songs, so that is wonderful. I have a, some songs that I want to do for you tonight on my guitar because I would have had to leave my piano at home and there were no plugins for the Roland on the, on the Oregon Trail. Excuse me, just going to get a, take a sip of water. The first one is, um, was written in by a woman named Mar Mary Dix Sullivan. It was popular in 1846. I have something sweet to tell you. It's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek song about her being coy about somebody that she's interested in. I have something sweet to tell you, but the secret you must keep. And remember, if it isn't right, I'm talking in my sleep. 
For I know I am but dreaming when I think your love is mine. And I know they are but seeming all the hopes around me shine. Oh, shut your eyes so earnest, or mine will wildly weep. I love you, I adore you, but I'm talking in my sleep. For I know I am but dreaming when I think your love is mine. And I know they are but seeming all the hopes around me shine. I, t I, t I uh, said something wrong. The next one, Blue Juniata, is written by Marion Dick Sullivan. The, that first one, I have something sweet to tell you. The words were written by a Francis Osgood. The Blue Juniata is a river in Pennsylvania. Wild robed then Indian girl, bright Alpharetta, where sweep the waters of the blue Juniata. Swift as an antelope through the forest going, loose were her jetty locks in wavy tresses flowing. Gay was the mountain song of bright Alpharetta, where sweep the waters of the blue Juniata. Strong and true my arrows are in my painted quiver. Swift goes my light canoe down the rapid river. Bold is my warrior good, the love of Alpharetta. Proud waves his snowy plume along the Juniata. Soft and low he speaks to me, and then his war cry sounding rings his voice in thunder cloud from height to height resounding. So sang the Indian girl, bright Alpharetta, where sweep the waters of the blue Juniata. Fleeting years have borne away the voice of Alpharetta. Still sweeps the river on the blue Juniata. And I have one more for you. Um, this is written by Maybelle Shirley, who is known also, uh, most famously as Belle Starr. Belle Starr was a concert-trained uh, pianist. She was a pianist who played concerts before she went west with her family to Texas. So um, at that point, she took up with a series of um, people who were not very savory, and she went down the wrong path, harboring criminals and running with uh, people who s were bootleggers and involved in unsavory activities. She did not ever um, kill anybody. Uh, she, the, worst, the worst thing she did was steal a horse. When I was researching the cowboy music, I came across a book um, by Jack Thorpe, who recorded quite a bit of, I mean, and when I mean record, he wrote down songs, uh, words of songs, lyrics of songs. And he wrote down a, a song that was written by Bell Starr. It's called The Bucking Bronco. So there was not a melody to it, so I came up with a little melody to it. So it's words by Bell Star, and I came up with this melody. It's a cautionary tale. My love's a wild rider, wild broncos he breaks. He's promised to quit it just for my sake. He ties up one foot, the saddle puts on with a swing and a jump, he is mounted and gone. The first time I met him was early one spring. He was riding a bronco, a high-headed thing. 
He tipped me a wink as he gaily did go, for he wished me to look at his bucking bronco. The next time I saw him was late in the fall. He was swinging the girls at the Tomlinson Ball. He laughed and he talked as we danced to and fro, promised never to ride another bronco. He made me some presents and bung them a ring. The return I made him was a far better thing. Twas a young maiden's heart, I'll have you all know. He'd won it by riding his bucking bronco. Now all you young maidens, where'er you reside, beware of the cowboy who swings the rawhide. He'll court you and pet you and leave you and go down the trail in the spring on his bucking bronco. <laughs> beware. So once people established themselves in their um, frontier towns, they wasted no time in establishing rich musical traditions. And Walla Walla is no exception. Um, Walla Walla, as you all know because you're here, has a rich musical history. There was the Smalls Opera House. There was Whitman University or Whitman Con um, Conservatory, which was the first conservatory. And their uh, piano, voice, music theory was taught. Faculty and students gave recitals for the community. Um, there was a great brass band tradition. And the cavalry bands from Fort Walla Walla played often for the citizens of Walla Walla. And one of the photographs of the images in my book is a picture of the cavalry band. Um, there was a woman who was known as the Jenny Lind of the West. Uh, Jenny Lind was a Swedish singer known as the Swedish Nightingale, who was very popular in the mid-1800s. And this uh, woman was Carolyn Maxim uh, Wood. And she uh, gave concerts in uh, Walla Walla and Portland, and she sold out houses. Uh, she sold out the house wherever she played. When she came out on the Oregon Trail, her father got swept away by the river, went downstream for several hundred feet, but they saved him. He was clinging to a branch when they found him. Um, so her family made it intact. And then there were. Um, the Bauer sisters. And Dr. Susan Pickett is here who wrote a book about the Bauer sisters, who I, and I used that book for research. The Bauer sisters were um, a Jewish family, a French Jewish family who lived in Walla Walla. And two of the sisters became um, pianists, composers, music critics, and they moved from Walla Walla to Portland and then finally to New York where they both uh, enjoyed renowned careers in, their, in the musical field. So those two were from Walla Walla. Um, it was also a family that had quite a bit of tragedy. Their father died when they were in Walla Walla. The mother moved the family to Portland. And then when the older sister, Marion Bauer, was visiting, uh, excuse me, when Emily Frances Bauer was visiting Mary, Marion Bauer in New York when they were there together, um, Emily Francis was hit by a car and died. So it was just, there's just so much tragedy in the, in the story of the, the West, but there, that's, that's our lives. But there was so much uh, uplift with the music, and I really think that the music helped people get through difficult times. My purpose of writing this book was to tell the underlying stories and to talk about the, the groups that don't get mentioned um, so often in the westward expansion. Um, there was a Yankton Sioux woman, Zeke Kalasa, who, who became a famous violinist and wrote an opera. 
Um, there was the brass band traditions and the band traditions of the Native American children who were forced into um, schools, boarding schools. One of the things that the boarding schools did to assimilate the children was to teach them how to play musical instruments. And that's what's on the cover here, um, playing mandolins and violins. This is in Fort Shaw, um, Montana, near Great Falls. This was taken in about 1890. And the, um, the St. Louis Fair was in uh, uh, 1904. This uh, group of women from, a group of women from the Fort Shaw uh, School went to the State Fair in, in playing basketball and they became the world champions in basketball. And at halftime they played their instruments. Um, but I, I did not know about this tradition at all until I started uh, uncovering more or, you know, learning more and more about it. I didn't learn about this in school. Growing up in Montana, we had a year of Montana history, two years. Um, so that was very interesting to me. And today there's, there continues to be a strong bass, brass band tradition um, with some Native Americans. And there's a documentary about that called Sousa on the Res. So I want to start, I want to end the program tonight with um, a piece of music that is, was written, written by Charles Wakefield Cadman, who was what's called an Indianist composer. He took a melody that was um, transcribed by a musicologist an ethnomusicologist by the Blackfeet tribes, a singer in the Blackfeet tribe, and then he created a piece of art music with it. This was a big tradition in the late 1800s called Indianist music. Arthur Farwell, Charles Wakefield Cadman were two of the composers who composed in this style. So it's not Indian music, but it was inspired by um, a melody. And this is called Nuwana's Love Song. By the way, there, these pieces are much, much longer than this. I'm just um, distilling them down to just a little bit to make everything fit for the program. So here's the melody. The Blackfeet Indian tune was obtained by Walter McClintock.
Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. It's so nice to have such lovely music in the Museum's Grand Hall. And thank you, everyone.